Focus on BBC One, Laura Koonsberg. We can wrap up warm to keep out the cold, but as the temperatures drop, can the government protect the NHS from a winter crisis? A cold snap sweeps the country, with the NHS preparing for another difficult winter. Waiting lists are still sky high. Our walking is so restricted now. Last time I checked with the waiting list, it was 50 weeks. So there's a frosty outlook for our new health secretary. But despite the freezing weather this week, 2023 is on track to be the hottest year ever. Leaders jetting in from across the world to the blazing Dubai sun. At a COP summit, they're talking climate change and listening to the call from the Crown. Some important progress has been made, but it worries me greatly that we remain so dreadfully far off track. But Rishi Sunak faces problems at home, right here, right now. So our big question this morning, as the temperature drops, can the NHS avoid a terrible winter? To answer that question, Victoria Atkins in her first interview with us as Health Secretary. Would Labour have it any easier? The Shadow Business Secretary joins us too. Israeli strikes on Gaza are back. Mark Regev, one of the Israeli Prime Minister's senior advisers, is with us live. And Nelson Mandela's granddaughter, activist Endelica, joins us from Dubai, where she's pressing the flesh with world leaders at the Climate Change Summit. Morning, morning. With me at the desk through the show, Jane Moore, the columnist and broadcaster, the historian, Lord Andrew Roberts, and also Professor Camilla Hawthorne, the Chief GP, President of the Royal College of General Practitioners. Now, we're going to spend a lot of this morning talking about health. The Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, is with us in her new job for the first time. Victoria, welcome. One of your colleagues said to me, what you do is going to make the difference to whether the Tories can hang on at the general election because health matters so much to voters. Feel the pressure? <laughs> well, look, the NHS is genuinely one of the reasons I came into politics. So I feel honoured, but also an incredible responsibility for everybody watching this programme. OK, well, we'll get into that with some of your questions for Victoria, too. But first, let's look at what is making the news this morning. Many of the front pages are dominated by the row over the royals who supposedly discussed the skin colour of Harry and Meghan's baby, identified this week supposedly by accident. The Sunday Mirror says that King Charles and the Princess of Wales will unite this week to rise above the fallout. Prince Harry has been left off the invite list for the Duke of Westminster's wedding, according to the Mail on Sunday. And the Sunday Express says King Charles's heart is breaking about the latest claims. The BBC website is leading right now with the news that a German tourist has been killed and two others injured after a knife and hammer attack in Paris last night. But the Sunday Telegraph splashes on Keir Starmer praising Margaret Thatcher. We'll get to that a bit later on. And the Observer focuses on Israel's attacks on southern Gaza. Let's stick with that story because last night Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said continuing the attacks on Gaza was the best way to secure the freedom of the remaining Israeli hostages. And this weekend Israel has carried out intense airstrikes on the south of Gaza and has pulled out of talks over the hostages in Qatar. Hamas says it will only release more hostages if there is a permanent ceasefire. But a UNICEF spokesperson in Gaza said the renewed attacks were catastrophic. Well, Mark Regev is one of Benjamin Netanyahu's senior advisors, and we can talk to him live from Tel Aviv. Thank you for joining us this morning. The truce is well and truly over. And this weekend, residents of the southern city of Han Yunus say the bombardments have been the heaviest they have been. It doesn't seem as if you are listening to calls from your allies, including the Americans, to take more care to protect civilians, does it? On the contrary, we're, we're making a maximum effort, maybe even unprecedented in, in similar circumstances. We've designated, it's not the entire city of Khan Yunus, which is 
going to be uh, uh, susceptible to combat operations. We've designated specific neighborhoods and we've given advance warning to the people in those neighborhoods, the civilians, to please leave. We, we've allocated special safer zones for them to go to. And the hope is that we won't see civilians caught up in the crossfire between the Israeli Defense Forces and the Hamas terrorists. But our viewers can see with their own eyes that civilians are being caught up every single day. And in Gaza, there is not enough fuel, there is not enough transport to imagine that every civilian could respond to every kind of warning. Obviously, a war is going on. It's a difficult situation. Uh, and the reason a war is going on is because of Hamas that not only started this conflict on October 7th when they invaded our country and butchered our people, but they uh, led to the end of the humanitarian pause. It was them who, it was Hamas that refused to follow through on its own obligations to release more prisoners on a list that they had agreed to. Uh, so the people of Gaza, if they have complaints, they know who sh they should point the finger at. That's clearly at Hamas. But we will, in, in the framework of, of, of pursuing Hamas, of destroying Hamas's military machine, we will, in accordance with international law, continue to make a distinction between combatants, that's the Hamas terrorists, and the civilian population who are not the target of our operation. Hamas, though, have said something very different about the end of the talks in Qatar. They say that they were willing to keep talking, there were other proposals, and it was Israel that walked away. Well, that's obvious that Hamas would say that, but other parties who were a part of the negotiating group have publicly uh, attested to what I said but previously, that it was Hamas's fault uh, that the talks did not, uh, that the truce did not continue. In terms then of what is happening now and the continuing bombardment and the effect on civilians, it's very clear, Mr Regev, in the last couple of weeks that your allies who want to stand by you have become increasingly alarmed by the scale of your response. The American Vice President Kamala Harris said yesterday that Israel has a right to defend itself, but not at any cost. To many observers, it looks like what Israel is doing is a collective punishment of an entire population that is illegal under international law. President Biden said at the beginning of this that the lesson from 9-11 was that a country must not be blinded by rage. Isn't that what's happening here? Not at all. I would assure you that that is not the case. And we're making a maximum effort. Uh, 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 I said before I used the word uh, unprecedented uh, to try to keep uh, civilians out of harm's way, to avoid them having, getting caught up in the crossfire. Uh, that is not our goal. That's why we've, we've actually sent out maps uh, a few days ago, uh, which designated the safer areas for people to go to. But, but it has to be clear, our task of safeguarding civilians is made especially difficult by Hamas's deliberate strategy of embedding its military terror machine, its command and control, its arms depots, its missile launching sites, amongst civilian neighborhoods, under hospitals, inside mosques, even uh, schools and UN facilities. And so we are trying to be as surgical as we can be in a very difficult combat situation. But I think when this is over, and the, the numbers are actually known because we're all actually using today the numbers of, uh, uh, put out by Hamas's controlled Ministry of Health and they have to be taken with a grain of, of salt. But when you will compare what Israel has done with Gaza, what let's say the UK and other Western forces did in fighting ISIS in, in, in Syria and in Iraq, you'll see that actually we, we, we have succeeded uh, through our measures to keep the level of civilian casualties very, very low. There are many charities, many eyewitnesses there on the ground who would dispute your description of what is happening to civilians in Gaza. But I do want to pick you up there. You said when this is over, there are many people asking questions about what will happen to Gaza at the end of this conflict. If you are successful in eliminating Hamas, what will happen to this piece of land then? So it'll be in a better, better situation because Hamas has been controlling Gaza for 16 years and not only there has has that been terrible and horrific for the people of Israel, but that has been uh, very sad for the people of Gaza because what have, has Hamas bought the Gaza Strip? What have they bought the Palestinians in Gaza over the last 16 years? Poverty, bloodshed, misery? Surely the people of Gaza deserve better than this uh, extremist uh, regime, uh, terror regime, uh, that, that doesn't give a hoot about the well-being of the people of Gaza and is happy to sacrifice the very last Gazan as long as they can advance their very, very extreme, crazy agenda. 
Mark Regev, thank you so much for your time this morning. We know it's a busy and fraught time in your part of the world. Thank you for being with us. And the BBC has been speaking to a Palestinian official close to the talks who gave a different account of what has happened there. They said, as we've been discussing, that Hamas had made proposals to reach an agreement to extend the ceasefire, potentially handing over more civilian hostages. But the BBC will, of course, have continuing coverage of that story and the situation there throughout the day. Now, let's then get on with our main story here at home this morning, the health service. Now, Camilla, you're the chair of the Royal College of GPs. At this time of year, patients, politicians start to get nervous about the idea of what's always called a winter crisis. Yeah. Do you think we can avoid something really awful for people in the next few months? So I think it's definitely tough out there, uh, not just for GPs, but right across the NHS. We have some really quite serious staff shortages and lack of resources. Um, I think that with winter comes respiratory illnesses, comes um, people slipping in streets and breaking their wrists and their hips and so on. Um, and I think that it is going to be a difficult time. I'd like to see what Victoria has to say about her short-term plans for this mm. winter. Um, I think that um, to some extent the government is um, reassuring itself with more ambulances, more virtual wards, more mm. beds. But you know, if we have another strep A crisis as we did last winter, we're really in trouble. And we know that people are not getting their vaccinations for flu and COVID at the rate that they should so be getting. So I really up. urge people to go and get their vaccinations now. Jane, I know you've had experience recently with a member of your family. I mean, what, what was your experience like? Um, well, I've spent quite a bit of time, um, I seem to be doing a tour of London hospitals, um, but uh, mainly to do with um, an elderly relative and falls. Uh, and I was in a very large, busy teaching hospital the other day in the middle of the day. Um, we, we reached the tri triage area with cubicles and I just sat and watched these young, primarily young staff and what they were dealing with. Um, and they were so overworked and they were dealing primarily with I, what I would interpret as social care issues. Mm -hmm. So people with, you know, mental health issues, um, particularly the elderly who couldn't get appointments with their GP so they just have to turn up at A&E um, as, as desperation and a lot of them I think I was talking to one elderly uh, person in the waiting area and it wasn't even that it was because she couldn't get an appointment mm. she didn't know how to go online you know she had a surgery that that would only deal with her online mm. she couldn't go into the surgery she mm. couldn't call up um, and it just seems to me now that increasingly and not all GP surgeries are mm. like this but my own surgery mm -hmm. i used to be able to get an appointment very easily now it, it's almost like this and, and they don't want to deal with the patients. answer for people we'll, i'm sure we'll talk about that a bit later um, but just before we talk to the minister andrew the patients and the public of course come first in all of this but the nhs is also tricky politically for conservatives isn't it yes it always has been it um, it didn't found the nhs back in 1948 although it didn't oppose it mm. and it had its own plans for that but every single general election labor claimed that they're about to, the tories are about to privatize the nhs which is complete rubbish even margaret thatcher didn't privatize uh, the nhs so it's been a uh, it's a painful and difficult uh, sort of minefield for the tories and painful and difficult right. of course when people are having painful and diff difficult experiences can I, can I so we'll, just we'll, 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 i just we want to get to the minister and then we'll get back to you guys straight after because there's a lot to talk mental about health is not a social care issue okay Sorry. all right oh, good thank, thank you very much all three of you for now so with all of that who would fancy being the health secretary? As we've been talking about, it's getting colder. That traditionally means that winter crisis. Last year, we all saw ambulances queuing as far as the eye could see, agonizingly long waits for patients, and the Prime Minister's big promise to cut waiting lists is looking pretty shaky. Let's remind you of some of the numbers in England, although there are challenges, of course, in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland too. There are nearly 7.8 million people on the waiting list for treatment. That is some number, the highest it has ever been. There are 761 fewer GPs than there were four years ago, despite the government promising more. And it took ambulances on average almost 42 minutes to respond to things like strokes and chest pains in October. That's more than double the target. Well, you, with all that, Health Secretary, you wonder why anybody would want to do the job. But as you said at the beginning, you care very much about it. You know that it is a privilege to have the job. But when you look at those numbers, how would you describe the state of the NHS? 
Well, the NHS looks after 66 million people. We have 11 million inpatients each year. There are doctors and nurses and volunteers working in our hospitals day in, day out. And I, I totally understand the, um, the, the focus on those cases where NHS care is less than we would hope and expect. But I do think it's also important to recognise that actually there are some very, very good news stories in the NHS. And may I just correct one thing? On the statistics, the waiting list is, uh, it's actually six and a half million people who are on waiting lists at 7.7 7, uh, pathways. Yes, but if you're waiting yeah. for two important things to happen to you, yeah. you know, it's absolutely right that these things are, are counted twice. Nobody would dispute that there is lots of excellent care, but there are lots of very serious problems. I mean, do you acknowledge that there are serious problems in the service? Well, yes, and, and this is why uh, we have record funding into the NHS, but we're also, uh, we have a series of uh, plans to tackle, for example, urgent and emergency care. So mm -hmm. in preparation for this winter, because of course we know that the NHS, like every other healthcare system in the world, when uh, temperatures drop, is gonna come mm -hmm. under pressure. And so for example, we're putting 800 new ambulances on the road to tackle those concerns that we all have about ambulances getting to people on time. We've got 5,000 beds um, being installed in the NHS at the moment to help provide that extra capacity for people. So you are trying to prepare, but we know from our viewers that these statistics often mean I've... terrible things in real life. Let's hear from one of them. Hello, I'm Lynn. I'm on a waiting list for back surgery and have been for over a year. I've been told the waiting list is years and that I'm not likely to get the surgery anytime soon. I'm restricted as to what I can do and I can't go on much longer like this. What are you going to do about the NHS waiting list? What do you say to Lynn? Well, first of all, I'm so very sorry that she is suffering in pain like that. You know, I, I want to help. Uh, Lynn and everybody else in the country that is facing these waiting lists and this is why in fairness the Prime Minister has made the waiting list one of his uh, priorities. And it's gone and up we, since he did that. I well, mean let's just show people what's happened to the, to right, the numbers because it's I'll important try and to understand that. the, I'll try and the explain context. That. Yeah. This is what has happened to waiting lists. We know of course the pandemic made things much more challenging yeah. but our viewers can see it was going up well before the pandemic. Lots more money has gone in. There are many many more staff this is the situation that people like Lynn are having yeah. to deal with. So if I may just try and explain some of this. So um, you're absolutely right to explain more money than ever before going into the NHS. And we have deployed that on trying to get more people into the NHS. So this week we met our manifesto promise that we would recruit a further 50,000 uh, nurses into the NHS. That is great news that we've been able to And there's still tens that. of thousands of vacancies. But, but I'd like you to address very it much because so. but this is the Prime Minister's target and it's going the wrong way. In terms of waiting so we have all these um, the, the plans that we have in place to deal with urgent emergency care, to deal with what is called electives, in other words, people that are coming in for non-emergency care. Um, but we do have to acknowledge that the impact of the industrial action mm -hmm. has uh, really had an impact on waiting lists. So it's since December last year, we've seen some 1.1 million appointments mm -hmm. have to be rescheduled. And so when I was appointed as health secretary, uh, I wanted to try to address the industrial action with doctors. And I'm really pleased that in the last three weeks I've, I've been in post, we have been able to reach a settlement with consultants. And I very much hope that consultants will vote for this when it's put uh, to them that will help to address some of that but th we are very clear that you know we want uh, our doctors our nurses to be able to work in the NHS because uh, that way we'll be able to not just deal with Lynn's case but obviously help uh, prepare for the future and of well. course sorting out the strikes was a big yeah. blockage in all of this why then did your predecessor Steve Barclay sit in that chair for months saying he wouldn't talk to the doctors well, look, what we've, what we've done with the consultants, uh, and I've, by the way, had a really constructive um, relationship with them so far, and I'm very much mm -hmm. um, looking forward to having that sort of relationship with doctors in training, uh, with our nurses mm -hmm. and, and others. But um, what we've done with the consultants is we have looked at their contract. That mm -hmm. contract was uh, set up in 2003. It didn't have the sorts of things that we would expect in our own working life. But my life, question such is, so you're explaining that you hope you've got to deal with them. My question is, you've said that the strikes are a big part of the reason why the waiting lists are sky high, why people are suffering. Why then did the government 
sit on its hands for months refusing to talk to the doctors. Isn't that responsibility on you too? So, so the, um, the, there are two things here. The uh, pay review board process, we have stuck to that. What we have announced in the last couple of weeks does not touch the headline rate of pay. It's about the underlying employment contract. And it's, it's actually really exciting for consultants because it means that uh, whereas um, uh, in the past it's taken up to 18 years to become qualified as a consultant with different um, sort of bureaucratic stages in the process, we have shortened that to 14 years with four progression points. And importantly for the taxpayer and for patients, this is not about time served. These changes are about the skill sets, the qualifications, that uh, potential and, and consultants And we've got a lot to talk to about, but just, just before we move on, how would you rate the chances of getting a deal with junior doctors? Briefly, please. Uh, I have had an extremely constructive uh, start to our relationship. I met them uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I popped into a, a meeting that we had, uh, that officials had this week. Uh, I very much hope they know that uh, I won't be able to meet some of their asks, but I am very interested in having conversations with them about, for example, the conditions in which they live, uh, in which they're working. And you know, when I've been visiting hospitals, talking directly to doctors, um, they've told me stories about you know, the rotors and how that has an impact on their ability to uh, keep going in what is a very tough job so at So you times. don't think they're militants like your predecessor? Uh, look, I, 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 it's a straightforward I always, question. I always take people as I find them. So uh, it's been very constructive and I'm very keen for us to continue that. Um, one of the things that people are doing because they're giving up on the NHS because they can't wait so long is sometimes turning private. Let's hear from one of our viewers. Actually, we're going to show you what one of our viewers said. Denise in Suffolk got in touch to say she was in too much pain to wait. She took a bank loan and crowdfunded a new hip. She now worries she needs the other hip done but would have to sell her house to do that. Is that acceptable? Uh, of course not, and this is why um, uh, we are. The, the Prime Minister has focused on waiting lists, as I say, and we are trying to get those down. We're making some progress. We have seen some of the longest waits virtually eliminated, but I, you know, this, there is no easy answer to this. And again, I, I, I very much, you know, my focus as Health Secretary will be to trying to help people can, such as you've described. Can with you their commit conditions. to it with the numbers going the wrong way? Can you commit that you're actually going to hit these targets before the general election? Um, we very much, um, uh, yeah, we are looking to meet those targets, but I need, please, the consultants to uh, pass this settlement that we've put forward. I hope very much that doctors in training will be able to reach a settlement with us as well. And then if we have, if we've removed the threat of industrial action from the NHS, then those people who, for example, mm -hmm. in the October set of mm -hmm. actions, we had 40,000 appointments being rescheduled each day, well then that can, that stops and we're able to get on with uh, the Just to be clear then, you're people. saying there that if the doctors accept the new deal, the Prime Minister might hit his targets and if they don't, we, you won't. We are, we're throwing everything we can at this, but not because, you know, we, I want to come onto the show and give you uh, easy answers. It's mm. because exactly for the people that you've described in today's more, uh, show, we need, to, we need to be helping but I want them to, looking uh, But I want them. to point out to our viewers what you've just said there matters because you're essentially implying, although perhaps not quite spelling out, that the Prime Minister's target to cut waiting lists won't happen unless you can sort out the industrial oh, disputes. We are doing everything we can, but I, right. we, we have an enormous amount of goodwill at the moment mm -hmm. from uh, the BMA and from others, and I'm keen to encourage that. And uh, again, would very much ask consultants to look at this settlement, because mm -hmm. actually it's a very modern contract, which I hope they'll find uh, acceptable. Have you ever used private healthcare? Uh, I used it once for a second opinion many years ago. Do you think uh, that but I've used the NHS my entire life. I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes on the NHS uh, and it's supported me every, you know, every year of my life since. Let's talk about a different part of the NHS than GPs. So Camilla, who's the chair of the Royal College of GPs, was talking about the pressure on them and she made it sound also like you're trying to convince yourself like you can avoid a sort of winter crisis. Yeah. There are fewer GPs now than when you made a promise to increase them. So what's going wrong? Well, we, we've actually recruited some 2,600 more GPs. But there are fewer full-time mm. GPs but and you promised 6,000 more. Yeah, but we, um, so we, uh, we, we want to recruit more GPs. We, we know some of the challenges that I'm sure Camilla will um, set out. We know some of the challenges they have faced, particularly coming out of the pandemic, where people stayed away from the NHS uh, and had... Um, 
uh, you know, they, they had conditions that they were concerned about, that they were, perhaps weren't coming to the doctors mm. during the pandemic because they were worried about COVID and worried about the pandemic. Um, so we know that there's that sort of uh, uh, group of people coming mm. forward. But I would point to the fact, and I'm extremely grateful to GPs for delivering mm. this, which is um, we've again reached another election uh, a promise that we made in 2019 of 50 million more GP appointments than 2019. Which we should also and point out to viewers really that, in, that includes COVID vaccinations, which is an important yeah, part it, of that too. But but important part. It, it is yeah. an important part, but it does include vaccinations. Um, I'd like you to give me a yes or no answer to this. Thinking of everything that we've discussed, all of the pressures, is the NHS going to avoid a winter crisis? Uh, we are going to do everything we can to do this. It's my number one priority for the winter um, because I know the worry that people have, particularly when uh, an accident or something like that mm -hmm. happens, a fall happens. We're going to do everything we can. And actually, in fairness, you know, the NHS has been working very hard to prepare for this winter. So well, it sounds like you're planning, hoping for the best, but the, not you can't rule the, it out. The planning started much earlier than normal. As I say, we've got uh, we're building 5,000 beds in hospitals. We've got more um, ambulances on the road. Uh, we've also got, you know, through access um, such as te telephony uh, appointments, I know uh, not everybody likes them, mm -hmm. but actually for some people they really do make the difference okay. to enable people to get it's the first time them. It's the first time we've, we've had you in, in, the, in this job, um, and we are running short of time, but I think we just yeah. can ask you a few quick questions. People like to get an idea of yeah. the kind of health secretary that you might uh, be. Um, are you the kind of person, do you think, who will intervene? Do you think there should be more taxes on naughty foods? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm determined to reform the NHS and our social care system to make it faster, simpler and fairer. And I'm going to be focusing on things actually such as geographical disparities. So in my very rural constituency in Lincolnshire, it can be difficult to get access to the sorts of services that we see in the centre of cities. And so that's going to be my um, focus. Do you have any unhealthy vices yourself? I've always already admitted to uh, a liking for chocolate hobnobs, which um, for a type one, yeah, that's probably not the best. <laughs> and forgive me for asking this, but viewers might be interested. People will have seen in the papers that your husband has yeah. a very big job at a ch big sugar company. Can you give us an idea of the kind of decisions that you might sit out from? Yeah. Will you stand back from something? So I've, you... I've always not only declared but recused myself from anything that may give the potential for a perception of a conflict. Uh, and I've done that um, in uh, this department. Uh, of course I did. Uh, but I'm also, I'm an independently minded woman and, you know, I voted I'm not suggesting any, any different, but conflicts of interest are, yeah, are yeah. important. I take it very seriously and I've recused myself from uh, sugar or anything, any policy that may um, have the perception of in, in any way being in, uh, involved in that. OK, and just finally, there's an important vote potentially in the House of Commons this week about the victims of the contaminated blood scandal. Yeah. A lot of our viewers will be aware of this injustice that's been rumbling for a lot of years. Will you support, as Health Secretary, a body to administer compensation for its victims? It would be a big statement and important for you to do so to many people. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I'm very, uh, very, very familiar with the circumstances of this because I have a constituent that I've worked with for many years um, who has been affected by this. Um, we, what we've done so far, obviously the inquiry has been called uh, and it's given its interim findings. We have made interim payments, importantly, to those affected the victims of the uh, uh, the uh, scandal itself. But it's right that we take our time to a, wait for so, the report, so, but so also we have to think through the consequences of that in terms of whether any legislation so not is this needed. Week. I must just ask you finally and briefly if you can yeah. on another subject an important one there are reports this morning that there are UK military planes conducting surveillance over Gaza yeah. what are they doing there? Um, I, they are unarmed and unmanned drones they are there to look for hostages because although we've had some hostages released uh, obviously, there are many more that still need to be released from captivity, and so they're there to support that effort. OK, Victoria Atkins, thanks. Health Secretary, thank you very much indeed for being thank with us much. in the studio this morning. Now, what did you think of what she had to say? Let us know. You can send us an email, kunzberg at bbc.co.uk. If you're social media minded, you can use the hashtag BBC Laura Kay, and we will share some of your views later in the show. Let's then get our panel views. Now, Camilla, you are a doctor. You sit in clinics as well as doing your teaching. And um, what did you think of what she had to say? Well, I thought it was, um, it, it's, we, we're, we're not a trade union, so we don't make any decisions on um, pay 
um, at all. That's the BMA's job. However, we're pleased to see the progress that's being made. It's not sorted yet, mm -hmm. um, but we're pleased to see that progress and we hope that the same thing will happen with junior doctors. Um, but they really have got some very valid reasons for their discontent that need to be listened to carefully and things need to change um, for the way that, uh, that, that, that they work. Um, there are national think tank reports that suggest that the waiting list problem is not just due to industrial action. Mm. Um, and so I think we need to take that uh, with a pinch of salt. Um, and I think that there needs, that's not the simple solution to the waiting list problem. It was interesting, Jane, wasn't it, to hear her very, very clearly basically point the finger and say it's the strikes what done it. But we could see from the graph we showed viewers actually lists have been going up long before the strikes yeah. and long before the pandemic. This has been a long problem a problem coming a long time and when it, when you're as old as I am you've seen many health secretaries from from you know all political persuasions make promises um, you know tinker around the edges it it clearly needs root and branch reform the NHS and I really don't understand why we don't have a big uh, like a cross-party initiative everybody put the political football down mm. sit down and go this needs to be sorted out it you know it, it is a great thing it's a great institution but we all need to come to an agreement on how we're going to do this sensibly without, you know, every time one health mm. secretary says one thing, the other party then starts shooting it down in flames. Stop all that, sit down, sort it out. And do you think that's possible? Yes, you could have a royal commission, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, these things do take years, of course, that's the trouble. Um, but it does seem that uh, however much money is pumped into the NHS year in, year out, and each health secretary uh, boasts about m extra mm -hmm. money going in, it doesn't seem to actually um, uh, make the difference. So there has to be, as you say, there has to be root and branch reform. And what might that look like in your view? Well. Um, do you know, I, th I was very pleased that Wes Streeting is going to Australia. Because the Labour Shadow Health Secretary. Absolutely. He's there. He's looking at... Um the fact that they have better uh, life expectancy than us, partly because they have a uh, integrated system between national, state and local, and also because they do a lot for preventatively. You know, they put money into trying to um, cost effectively stop people from mm. going to hospitals right. in the first place. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's something that Victoria Atkins uh, is looking at as well. And we'll be talking to Jonathan Reynolds from the Labour Party in a few minutes' time. But Camilla, there is a valid point there, isn't there, that Andrew raised, that all this money goes in, mm. health secretaries enjoy boasting about it, and then yet for taxpayers, more doctors, more money, in lots of cases, care getting worse and waiting lists going up. So what are viewers meant to think of that this morning? Paying all this tax, the mm. NHS is protected unlike other departments, yes. what's going wrong? Well, certainly in general practice, as you were saying, the number of full-time qualified GPs is going down. And so we are um, pushing lots of young doctors into general practice, but they are leaving the profession faster than they're entering it, wow. going, going to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, you know, where um, they have a better quality of life and where they have um, a better work-life balance than we have here. I think you've got to bear in mind that you know over the 30 years that I've been a GP, mm. medicine has changed dramatically. So of course it's going to be more expensive. People are now surviving who wouldn't have survived when I was a junior doctor. We've got some really impressive treatments that are keeping people alive with a better quality of life than ever before in terms of heart disease, stroke, and so on. So um, it's, it's some of it is that it does cost more. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, we have to decide what we want to pay for as a country. And we we also need to um, have a look at the NHS and in terms of its management, how it's managed and where there's waste. Because politicians also enjoy saying, oh, there are too many managers, get rid of them. But actually, if you look at some academic studies, they say we need more managers, it needs to be better managed. I mean, Jane, do you think that the management is a sort of bogeyman for politicians? I, I think so, but I think the key word that Camilla came up there is, is waste. Mm -hmm. I think there is a, a lot of waste within the NHS, unnecessary waste. I mean, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but they talk about, you know, it costs £68 to change a light bulb because they outsource it and all of that. You know, just somebody that will look at, take an overview of all of that. I mean, that would make, it's not going to change it, but it's going to make a huge difference. And a lot of unnecessary testing, uh, where more experienced staff that could come back that might take the judgment that that, that test isn't needed too much medication handed out that's unnecessary. So just sort of things like that, that that would sort of start putting it in the right direction. Okay, well maybe I think you three have 
sort of done a programme advert for a Royal Commission and somebody to come in and look at all of that, although I know the Chancellor has actually announced already a review of public service productivity, to use the fancy term, but we'll see where it gets to. It might not have escaped your notice that last week we had the Greek Prime Minister on the programme who repeated his country's position that they would like the Parthenon sculptures or the Elgin marbles, there they are, to be returned to Athens. But Rishi Sunak seems to have taken it rather badly and cancelled their meeting and it ended up with a huge diplomatic spat. Um, yesterday I had a chat with Yanis Varoufakis, a well-known former Greek finance minister. Let's have a listen to what he had to say about it all. Our people have been allies for 200 years. British soldiers and Greek soldiers, we have shed blood together for 200 years in all the major conflicts. It's pathetic to be having a spat over this. Pathetic to be having the row? As a historian, is it pathetic to have a fight over this? Well, we've been having a um, row over this for sort of 60 years now, <laughs> since Lena Mercurian and earlier than that. Um, so, um, so yes, it is, it is pathetic. Um, it, uh, it's unnecessary. Look, meetings between heads of government um, require Sherpas, as they're called, to mm -hmm. talk about what's going to be discussed beforehand. And, uh, and when it became clear that uh, Mr Mitsotakis wasn't going to stick to what the Sherpas had agreed, um, it, uh, it was a decision for Rishi Sunak either to make this into a big row or to essentially lose. Mm -hmm. And he decided to turn it into a big row instead. And do you think that was wise? Um, I don't know whether politically it was uh, right, wise, but actually in terms of, uh, of what the marbles are all about and getting, reminding the British people why actually they should stay in London um, and getting that uh, argument out there again, um, maybe that is a good thing because next year or whenever the Labour Party come to power... Are um, you sure that's going to happen? Um, no, I'm not sure that's going to happen, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, it's, it, all the polls for a long time have uh, implied that it might. Mm. Um, the, uh, they're going to be in the same situation mm. as, uh, as, as Rishi is in at the moment. Although, interestingly, despite the huge brouhaha, I think actually the policy of the two big parties is basically the same. If the British Museum can agree alone, then that would happen and they wouldn't stand in the way. But I just wonder, Jane, having watched lots of political and diplomatic spats over the years, were you surprised by how it got to him? And we ended up with the king, I'm sure completely by accident, wearing a tie <laughs> with the Greek flag on it at an international summit. I think we can see, show our viewers a picture of it in case they missed it. Um, there it is, the Greek flag. I mean, if he was trying to make a point, if he was trying to make a point, he could, he could hardly point. have been clearer. I think he was just trying to bring out the blue in his eyes. Uh, <laughs> well, but do you think that voters really actually no, find this kind of thing? A no, bit, right. and I, I, I read a very funny thing yesterday where somebody just said, look, this is what 3D printers are for. <laughs> <laughs> Split them up. We'll, ha we'll make one from a 3D printer. We'll have that and then they can have the other one. There we go. Well, there's another idea. You're very creative as a trio <laughs> this morning. Thank you to all three of you for now. Now, as we've been discussing, it's not hard to find reasons to criticise the state of the health service if you're an opposition politician. But Labour's big promises on waiting lists and more appointments are easier to say than to do. How different would it really be if the party was in charge? Jonathan Reynolds, the Shadow Business Secretary, is with us from Salford this morning. Good morning to you. Um, we're going to start with something else, though, before we Good talk morning. about the NHS. Your boss has been telling the world today that Margaret Thatcher dragged Britain out of its stupor. What's he up to as the Labour leader saying that? Well, the point that Keir is making is that he has changed the Labour Party. And on the strength of that, he can go to people and say, we can change the country. And there have been prime ministers who've done that. I would think of Atlee Blair, but Thatcher is someone, even though I wouldn't support her politics, I would recognise she was that force for change. And at the next election, if people want change, it's the Labour Party that will be the vehicle to do that. If they want more of the same, they can have that with the Conservatives. But Keir is in a position now to say, look, if you want change, if you want national renewal, Labour is the vehicle to do that. What do you most admire about Margaret Thatcher? Well, as I've said, I think you can separate out the policy agenda. I mean, as you know, I come from a mining town in, in County Durham. So on a political level, her policies, not something I'd be sympathetic to, but I would certainly recognise her as a formidable opponent, you know, or an opponent you'd have to respect. You had an agenda, who implemented that agenda. There was big change after the 1970s. We don't need to discuss that, but there are prime ministers who make a difference, who do change the future of the country, who do come with that consistent and combined agenda that changes the path of the country. We've seen that in the past. We haven't had that for the last 13 years. We've had, you know, things year to year, prime minister to prime minister. It's quite hard to even keep track 
of them, let alone their agendas. There are people, however, who do do it differently. And I think I can recognise in someone like Thatcher, someone who did that, even if I wouldn't support the specific policies that she had. Except that you say we don't need to discuss what happened in the 70s. There are a lot of people in the Labour Party and on the left who still would find it that it really sticks in their craw to have their leader citing Margaret Thatcher as a positive force. Is Keir Starmer just again, as some people might see it in the party, trying to troll the left? No. What Keir is doing is setting out a prospectus for the country that everyone can get behind. And of course we recognise there are, everyone knows this, there are Conservatives in this country who are perhaps people who voted Conservative for a long time, who are dismayed at the performance of a Conservative government. And we should be reaching out to those people to build the kind of national coalition that we can bring behind change. I mean, if you're a Conservative who wants people to own their own home, you're not getting that from this government. If you want to conserve the natural environment, you see sewage in the waterways. If you believe in control of, of the immigration system, you've clearly not got that. So we can speak to those people and we can build. And actually, the leaders who really do, the Prime Ministers who really do deliver change, Laura, they build a wider coalition than the one they inherited and every successful political leader certainly the people who have the ambitions of the scale that Labour has for the country that's what they should be doing but Keir Starmer has also said this morning in this piece he wrote for the Sunday Telegraph that people are not certain about Labour now if things are really as awful as you suggest and Labour is really as appealing as you suggest why do you think that there are still people who are not certain about you well I think first of all the scale of change in Labour since 2019 is, is, to be honest, a lot of people thought that wouldn't have been possible to even be this competitive. So of course we're proud of what we've done, we're just not complacent about the future. We recognise people, as I say, people who perhaps voted Conservative for a long time, are dismayed at their government, they can see Labour's changed, they maybe want to know a little bit more, want to know a little bit of detail. Can we really go with these people? Can they be the force for change that we want them so to be? So you're not being clear enough be, about what you would do in office? In that. We, no, we've got to work harder as ever because there's never going to be a shred of complacency. If we saw, if, a change of government at the next general election, I don't think there would ever have been a turnaround as dramatic as it would represent from the result that Labour got in 2019. So, of course, we're, we're proud of what we've done. We're just not complacent about the future. And we are going to keep working exceptionally hard to win over more people, more supporters, build the national coalition for change and national renewal that we think we need. Well, let's talk about how you might, as you describe, renew some things of the country. Um, you might have heard we've been talking a lot about health this morning. Now, one of your colleagues in the party, Andy Barnum, the mayor of Manchester, said this week that inheritance tax should be overhauled to pay for social care. Do you agree? Well, look, I, that's obviously Andy's personal proposal that he has, um, I think, been interested in for some time. That's not national Labour policy, though, of course, there'll always be a debate uh, on these things. But what I would absolutely agree with is a plan for the health service requires a plan for social care. And obviously for us, we've got some very specific commitments around things like fair pay agreements, where we want to see standards for not just the, you know, people who work in social care, but the whole career that could represent be improved and of course that directly links to those the huge increase in health and social care visas we saw in the net immigration figure so I think this is a huge national priority but for us it is about renewal of the health service the money we put into there for for instance scrapping the uh, non-dom uh, tax regime for the super rich 3.2 billion pounds we then have available to put into different parts of the health service but, but a plan for social care has to go with that and it has to have at the heart of it driving up standards and I want to stick on that because you have made some commitments about training and the workforce on social care but it's important for viewers to know we are yet to see a comprehensive set of proposals from the Labour Party for social care. And we've asked your colleague, Wes Streeting, who wants to be the health secretary, about this actually repeatedly. We asked him about it um, in the autumn. We said, when would we see it? He said, ah, we don't want to torpedo next week's Labour conference announcements in October. We had to wait and see. And we've waited to see and we haven't seen anything. So when will there be a comprehensive plan from Labour for social care? Well, I think on all of health and social care, where you've got some incredibly specific commitments, funding commitments that come from switching That's not spends, my question, like I said, the non Mr. Reynolds, tax regime. When will we see a big but, but, proposal for social care? Because quite rightly, many experts would agree with you, without a big plan for social care to be sorted, the wider problems of the NHS are not going to be solved either. So when will we see from Labour a comprehensive set of proposals for social care? 
Well, that is what we're building up. You mentioned Wes's uh, visit to Australia. We're looking at different systems around the world. How do people do things better? How do they do it when resources are, yes, going to be strained? So, of course, we're building up that manifesto position for perhaps a general election uh, at some point next year. But the point being that we absolutely agree, I think most people do, that social care and health need a joint plan together. And that is absolutely what Wes and the Shadow Health team are committed to. So you're dangling it again. It sounds today that there will be in the Labour manifesto, which of course is still some way off, a comprehensive plan for social care. But we will keep asking this question because we know that our viewers really care about it. I'd like to ask you a kind of question of principle, really, about the health service. Um, under the Conservatives, health spending has been protected. It's been ring-fenced. Is something that if you is that something if you win office that Labour would commit to doing forever that health will be protected? Well, we absolutely believe the health service has pride of place in in public services. We would obviously like a situation where we can grow the economy more strongly. So no department is facing in terms of uh, real terms cuts in the next parliament in terms of what the, the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has put forward at the minute for his spending plans but of course funding for health is important but so is reform and trying to find new and better ways to do things we've got for instance in the NHS uh, you know a situation where one in five trusts are basically still using the same diagnostic equipment the same scanners as they were, had put in in the last Labour government, we've got fewer scanners uh, per head per patient than Australia or New Zealand or the US or actually most countries. So how you do things differently, how you can work with the workforce, give them the equipment they need to do things in a different way is as important to us as the funding that goes into that. But of course, we are of all Labour's achievements over history in office. The NHS is the one we are most proud of, and it will always be a public service free at the point of use under Labour. But you can do things differently to give people the different kinds of health care they need, and that is what we're committed to. OK, it will always be a big subject of political discussion. Jonathan Reynolds, thanks so much for joining us from Salford this morning. It's always good to have you on the programme. Now, at home, one of the hardest problems for the politicians to solve is the state of the health service, as we've been discussing. But abroad, trying to slow down changes to the climate is the challenge of a generation. World leaders have been schmoozing in Dubai at the climate summit, COP28 as it's known, to try to do just that. But whose interests do they really represent? Indelica Mandela is the granddaughter of Nelson Mandela. She's now an activist and I'm pleased to say she joins us this morning from the summit. It's great to have you on the programme. We're pleased to have you. Thank you very much for your time. Now, this year's COP is being held in the seventh biggest oil producing country in the world. Your name brings a certain cachet to the meeting, but do you think world leaders are now taking climate change seriously enough? Well, I do think they are, you know, otherwise we wouldn't be having this, this COP28. And also the fact that, you know, we can't always be pointing fingers that, you know, the UAE is an oil producing country. We need to meet around the table. If you remember, our democratic dispensation in South Africa was begotten by sitting around the table and debating issues. That's how we got to our, our democratic dispensation. Similarly, with climate change, we need all hands on deck, not to point fingers, but to sit around and see what solutions can we come up with to combat the effects of climate change. And from what you've heard so far this week, there have been some promises of hundreds of millions of dollars to help countries that are most hardly affected. From what you've heard, are you satisfied that we are seeing the kind of action that's required? Well, there is. However, I believe that there could still be more. You know, we've had other COP uh, before. What for me is, is really lacking and what would be telling at the end of this summit is whether steps are going to be put into place to have consequence management. If countries don't adhere to what has been decided at this summit, what then? Because we can't keep on having summit after summit and policy after policy, policies that cannot be implementable without actually evaluating if the past ones have worked and what has not worked in the past ones. So until such time that we evaluate and see how we go forward and with the consequences of what happens, if that the, 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 the decisions and, and agreements that are, uh, have been reached at the summit are not adhered to. 
your grandfather changed the world with his bravery and charisma in dismantling the apartheid system in South Africa. You now have talked about climate apartheid. What do you mean by that? And do you think your grandfather would approve of you using that term to describe what's going on? Yes, because I mean, climate, uh, uh, apartheid was a, a systematic, a, a systematic uh, method of discriminating against people and they subjugated especially black people and it was held by a few which was a, a minority, minority group which was subjugating black people and humiliating them on a daily basis. Similarly, climate, uh, I call it climate apartheid because that has been exported to a global stage where the global north is using their economic and legal power to subjugate poor nations who are, are at the brunt of the effects of, of, climate, of, of climate change. That's why I call it climate apartheid because it's a similar way that the apartheid use, they use their, their economic and legal power to subjugate black people. Similarly, the global north is subjugating the global south with, uh, 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 with uh, the carbon emissions because uh, Africa and the global south has the smallest percentage of carbon, of, of carbon emissions, more than the global north. That's why I call it a climate apartheid. Now your grandfather had a close relationship with the late Queen and King Charles has been at COP this week urging world leaders to do more. But recently you wrote that there are still ripples of colonialism and apartheid still lingering in South Africa and that the British royal family still benefits from colonial structures. Do you think that the royal family should think about paying reparations? Ha, ah, that's a tough one. Um, I think it starts with acknowledging before reparations. If there can be an acknowledgement of what was done to countries that were colonized, because we are still suffering a great deal from colonization in as far as our culture as black people is concerned. So there has got to be first admission of the fact that yes, we acknowledge that we displaced you as a people. Then we can talk of reparations. And would you like to see that kind of thing from the British royal family? Yes, I would. I mean, that's, that, that's where, you know, healing begins. With if, if you are arguing with the next person and you come to a tiff, when you sit around the table and admit your part, both parties admit their part in the dissolution of whatever it is that happened. It is then that healing begins. And if that happens, the healing will definitely begin. And lastly, if I may ask you, you've written about the role of the Duke and, Duke, Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan. You said that they were widening the boundaries of discourse and bringing some unsavoury realities to light. Um, I'm sure you know there's been a lot of argument about their role and recently about whether or not the potential appearance of their unborn baby was discussed by members of the royal family. Do you believe that Harry and Meghan were victims of racism in this country, do you think? I believe Harry and Meghan had to find their own voice in a similar way that Grandad had to find his own voice when he, was, he had, had to run away from an arranged marriage. So they should be given, like any other person, room to voice out whatever their misgivings are. I cannot speak to whether Harry and Meghan's children have been discriminated because I don't have first-hand information of that. However, I can say this, that he should be allowed to voice out whatever it is that he wants to voice out and choose his own path. Because had Granddad not chosen his own path, as when he ran away from an arranged marriage, wouldn't have the South Africa that to talk about today. So people should be allowed, to, because we have different journeys, should be allowed to, to walk different journeys in life. And Delica, thank you so much for joining us from COP from Dubai. It's been great to have you on the programme and a pleasure to speak to you this morning. Thank you very much indeed.
Now, let's pick up on that story that we were talking about there, the race row, which started a long time ago, Jane, with comments from Harry and Meghan and the, their tell-all interview with Oprah Winfrey. Um, in the last two days, in case people have been living under a rock, there's been a row because two members of the family have been named supposedly by accident in a book about all of this. The suggestion is the royals might take legal action, that they might acknowledge it somehow. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, I don't know. It would be very unusual for the family to take legal action because, of course, part of the problem here is that, you know, the whole never complain, never explain thing mm. sort of always makes it very difficult for them to, to come back when accusations like this are made. I mean, mm. sort of going back to the Oprah Winfrey interview, you know, Meghan made it very clear that concerns were expressed about the, the baby's skin colour, which I think whichever perspective you come from would suggest an element of racism. Two years later, so they let that dwell, two years later, Harry then gives an interview saying, absolutely not, we're mm. not implying that it was that it was said in a racist way. Mm -hmm. um, now we have these names mysteriously mm -hmm. appearing mm -hmm. in, a, in a manuscript, which it's very, you've very, written 20 very, very novels, tangled. this does not yeah, happen. It's very, very tangled. Um, but yeah. But what do you think should happen, Camilla? So I'm part of a mixed race family. Um, and of course, we talked about um, the color of our children and grandchildren. I think it's a common conversation <coughs> that in Britain, which is a multicultural nation now, um, that kind of conversation happens all the time so it all depends on the context in which it was said was it said in a racist way or not and, and we don't know that. know that we don't know and you just put it finally, out publicly and, and you just finally see to you yeah can i can i just say first of all just pick up a couple of things mm -hmm. that uh, miss mandela said um south africa became independent in 1906 to still blame 117 years later colonialism is completely ludicrous the second thing she said about the royal family paying reparations mm -hmm. is also completely wrong no king has owned slaves since the charles ii 350 years ago you know you have to get historical context this and with regard to the race row it's absolutely up to prince harry to say that this is a terrible lie and that that his father and his sister-in-law are not racists. So the ball is in his court. Absolutely it is. All three of you, thank you so much for being with us this morning. It's been great to have you. And we've spent most of the morning talking about health. There are few issues closer to any voter's heart than what happens to the NHS. And right now, it's not always pretty. Despite the Prime Minister's many promises to bring waiting lists down and last year's talk of solving the problems of social care. We spoke to the new Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, this morning, who acknowledged it's going to be a difficult winter. Uh, we are going to do everything we can to do this. It's my number one priority for the winter um, because I know the worry that people have, particularly when uh, an accident or something like that mm -hmm. happens, a fall happens. We're going to do everything we can. And actually, in fairness, you know, the NHS has been working very hard to prepare for this winter. Lots of you have been giving us your thoughts. Paul Jones emailed to say, we have reluctantly taken out private healthcare insurance as our view from inside the NHS is that it can no longer cope. Dr. Suleiman Raman Sabir says Victoria Atkins sounds so out of touch with reality. The NHS is already in crisis. But Jack Kent says, I'm very impressed with Victoria Atkins. At last, we have someone who seems to care and understand our NHS. But don't be surprised if, as the temperatures plummet and winter colds and flu do their worst, that the pressure rises on ministers and managers to make the health service work after it was battered by the pandemic. You'll likely hear more about that at box office appearances at the COVID inquiry this week. But remember, the problems crept in long before and an ageing population cranks up demand. In parts, the system is frayed. But the standard of care we get is certain to be one of the most talked about real world factors in the next election. That's for sure. Thank you so much to my panel for being with us all this morning. Thank you to you for watching. In a second, I'll be with Paddy O'Connell for this Sunday's newscast. You can listen to that later on BBC Sounds. Of course, there's always tons more on iPlayer if you want to catch up. Or simply, I'll see you here next week. Same time, same place. Goodbye. Again, the Time Lord and the